Hi, I'm Ruth. And I'm Brenton. Welcome to Spectrum Today. Glad to be able to spend some time with you, update you on some items that are in the news and share yes. our time together with a great interview. It's always good to be able to share guests with you today. Yeah. Well, Ruth, did you have a good Memorial Day weekend and get all of the, the fun things done? And of course, pause also and remember those who've given their lives. Mm -hmm. we, we spent time doing that on, on Sunday. Sunday. That was very nice. And I spent some time yesterday thinking about that and um, making sure that it wasn't just spent, it's not just a day off, right? It's right. a day of remembrance. So I tried really hard to do that. But the weekend was great. You mentioned the services and they were really nice on Sunday and people are getting out. And of mm -hmm. course the weather is beautiful, except for the wind. I wish it wasn't as windy as it's been, but it's still pretty outside. I agree. I, I, I could use less wind, but I hear that this week might be a little bit improved with the wind, so I'm, I'm hopeful. Yeah. Well, let's jump into the news today. One of the things that is interesting, we're going to talk a little bit about inflation today, but one of the items is the fact that all these real estate markets that have been so hot are starting to see price cuts. I mm -hmm. talked to a, a local realtor over the weekend, and they said that that was actually impacted. She was seeing that happening right here in the Albuquerque area mm -hmm. as well. But some of the biggest markets uh, that have, have seen this, uh, the folks, I think it's at Redfin, have said that uh, more than 20% of home sellers have dropped their prices in um, seven out of the 10 top uh, markets in the country. You know, and we had talked a little bit about this recently, places like Tampa and Phoenix, they were really, really going. But they're starting, and some of that was because of people moving in. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of people moving into an area. Right. But they're starting to see that these interest rates are starting to price people out. It is. I think it's most of them are at the interest rates are like five percent. Yeah, roughly five. And so as it increases, it makes it a lot harder. It does because you know we got used to it being at like mm -hmm. three and a half, mm -hmm. down to almost three percent. I think it edged lower than three, very short for a very short period. 5% traditionally is a great interest rate. I mean, you can't complain right. about that. But as prices go up, if you're going to have to spend more money to, to buy a house, um, even if the interest rate is, say, 5%, that prices a lot of people out. So now the home uh, sellers are starting to have to uh, compensate for that, saying, well, we may not be able to get some of the amounts that we thought that we about would In before. April, 41% of home sellers in Idaho Boise, dropped, Boise, Idaho dropped their prices. Yeah. And uh, some of the other places, like Cape Coral, uh, Florida, wasn't too far behind, about, a, I think, a third of the people there uh, dropping their price. So that'll be something interesting to watch. They tell us one of the ways that inflation really stops is when people just can't pay it anymore. And they say, you know, we're just not going to do it, mm. or we can't do it. And that kind of becomes the end of it going up, 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 up in the way people stop. So that's an interesting thought, kind of interesting to see if that might be bring a little bit of hope and relief on the horizon. There are some tips, however, to those of us enduring inflation. And um, I, okay. I came across this, and it was uh, dealing with a... Uh, Finance ex expert, uh -huh. yeah, the person Rachel who Proust. kind of knows some things that are good to share. One of them is the fact that you know the budget, staying you know, on budget, right? And know. even writing it down, having a, a list of your income and then all of your expenses, mm -hmm. and also really thinking about okay, what are my the needs that I have? Of course, you have your your mortgage, your groceries, your fuel to get places, right? Yeah, your utilities. But you need your utilities, so writing things down, and I think it helps to see it in front of you. Okay, this is the total income, this is my total expense, and making sure they balance, or at least you ha that you have something, because you want to make sure that you have a roof over your head. Also, you may think of uh, adding another, try to find another job, maybe a second job in the evening hours or on the weekend when you're off from your yeah, other job. That, that's or, a hard thing to do, but it, sometimes it becomes necessary. Mm -hmm. A second job to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, if, if you're not if you're not able to make it on your budget, yes. Right. You and I were talking about someone that we knew who shared uh, some weeks ago that they were considering bringing in a second uh, person into the home, like to maybe to rent oh, yeah. a room or something, so that they could combine their income, right? Make it a little easier for each for each one of them to make it during this time. Right. Um, I think it's important for us to be proactive, you know, and to really ask, are there things, know where your dollars are going is another mm -hmm. tip. You really need to know, where am I spending my money? 
Am I spending it on things that are frivolous that I could cut out? Or are they necessities? You know, I can't change how much the electricity bill is. I mean, I, and they're really cautioning, too, that in parts of the country, we could see really a rising electricity uh, bills this summer mm -hmm. because of, you know, concerns that are out there that are going to impact electricity costs. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, you know, what do you do? How, what, what temperature do you run the thermostat at? You know, do you turn it up during the daytime? I mean, all of those kind of things. Of course, that can, if your house gets too hot, that can impact things. It can be harder to cool it later. Yeah. So there's all these... these uh, also, money flowing in and money flowing out, obviously. And if you have savings and you're dipping into your savings, be sure you keep track of that and pay yourself back as soon as possible because you don't want to deplete what you have in savings. Right. right? You want to replace it as soon as you can. Well, moving on to a different topic, uh, of course, we know that there's been a lot of discussion about guns ever since the shooting in Uvalde mm -hmm. about a week ago. Um, one of the things that came out, President Biden, on uh, Monday of this week, you know, was really taking aim, pot shots, I don't know what you would say, at 9 millimeter handguns, saying that they are a high caliber weapon, and yet, isn't it half or more than half? Mm -hmm. Uh, roughly of the weapons that are yeah, sold, it's forty percent, forty percent, right about there. Okay, mm -hmm. not quite half. Uh, our nine millimeter mm -hmm. handguns that are sold in America, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to believe that them thinking of that as a high caliber weapon. Now, that is the type type of weapon that most of uh, I think our police force carries, nine millimeter. Mm -hmm. they, that's you know, kind of the, the standard thing anymore. It's hard for me to believe that there's going to be ability for them to I, I'm not even sure it's illegal. I, I don't think Again, he can I, think, I think that's that. part of what he said was that he can't do that but he also said something that was interesting to me because he said remember the Constitution was never absolute and I'm thinking okay that's the, the foundation point of what we use for the entire country's <laughs> legal system but it's not absolute you know, that's the problem with America right now nobody wants anything to be absolute uh -huh. They don't want morals to be absolute. They don't want family values to be absolute. Now the president's saying that the Constitution's not absolute. You know, mm -hmm. people have already said, hey, the Bible's not absolute, although it, it is absolute. God meant exactly and absolutely what he said. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's, it's our desire, isn't it? Humanity's desire yeah. to say, well, you know, there's got to be an exception. There's a little bit of gray area there. Mm. No, when it comes to truth, truth is truth. And Things that are not truth are still untrue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that with the president. That's it, it, certainly nobody wants there to be gun violence. But you know, I it, and I, it was and it's an awful thing that happened in Uvalde. It is, Texas, but you it know, really is an awful thing that happened. One of the things that I I saw over this uh, weekend, I'm not but I sure. Think that, a lot, and, and a lot of that, I think, the news coming out was the hesitation on part of the police department that didn't rush. Right. But, but, you know, here's something else that, that we need to remember. There were over 50 shootings in Chicago this weekend with 10 murders. There were more people shot in Chicago this weekend, by far, more than double what was shot in Uvalde. And they have the strongest gun laws in the country. It just points to the fact that strengthening gun laws does not change criminals' usage of guns. Mm -hmm. And see, that's the problem. It doesn't offset the moral decay of America. Yeah, you've got people, many of which are younger people. I mean, mm -hmm. we can't say that in, in unanimity because mm -hmm. we certainly had a, a plus 60 shooter, I think, who shot up a church just a few, right. uh, a couple weeks ago. Right. Uh, but you've got these younger people who don't really have a moral compass. They don't have parents that are in the home in a traditional family right situation mm -hmm. with a mom and a dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got problems. The, the country has problems because of the moral rot that's in this country. That's true. You think about the the person that committed the crime in Uvalde and, and the interviews that they've had with a stepfather. Um, and I haven't seen the interview with his dad. However, I read a part of what he said. But it didn't seem like too many people were very interested in him, that they were okay with him not talking. They were okay with him being in his room all the time. They were okay with him playing the games he played. And you can tell me that it doesn't bother you, but those things affect have an effect on you when that's all you're doing and you're locked up in a place yeah. and you don't feel like you and you're you're detached you've been detached because of covid and the restrictions of traveling to see your biological father you don't have a relationship with your mother and then it seems like nobody cares about you well things happen things happen and they don't they 
they don't all, they usually don't happen well. Awful. They usually end poorly. Very sad. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. Watch the Daystar Network 24 hours a day on KAZQ 32.5. got some great news to report, Ruth. Um, hey. the, some of the production equipment has started arriving. Isn't that great? Uh, in fact, we've received the cameras uh, in, so we're going to be able to start utilizing those for some production, for some family entertainment programming that we've just begun. A lot of it goes into bigger production next week. I'm not sure that we'll be able to share the end result with you for a while because it takes a while to get those things produced and out the door. But we're excited about the brand new cameras. Um, we have probably raised a little over um, a third approaching closer to halfway point. We need to raise about $30,000 and I think we're around ten dollars to $12,000 in the funds raised. So your donations to the President's Club really matter. Those $25, $50, $75, $100 donations, any that size really makes a difference. Really and uh, of course, we're thankful for every person who's donating. Thank you for your support. God is good and we're so grateful for each of you who have partnered with us over the years and those who have just recently come aboard and partnered with Alpha Omega Broadcasting. We're thankful for you. Remember, you can visit us online at kazq32.org to give safely there. Just allocate what your donation is for so we can make sure it goes to the right place. You can call into the station at 505-884-8355, extension 101, to speak to someone. No one answers. Please leave a detailed message, and we will call you back. Or you can also send in your donation to Alpha Omega Broadcasting at 4501 Montgomery Boulevard Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87109. If you'd like to call in for prayer, we're available to pray with you here in the station and just believe with you for whatever your need is. God is good and he will supply every need that you have. Thank you for what you're doing. Don't forget if you're not on the mailing list and you'd like to get on that digital mailing list, send us your email to info at kazq32.org and we'll get you those updates. Watch Jimmy Swagger and the Sun Life Network 24 hours a day on KAZQ 32.3. We're privileged to have with us today Dr. Jerron Campbell, who is the founder and principal of ACES Technical Charter School, which is right here in Albuquerque. Dr. Campbell, glad to have you with us today. Thank you. Good morning. We're excited to be able to learn a little bit today about charter schools, but specifically about what you are involved with and what you are doing. I know your school is newer. Give us a little bit of a background about the mission and, and what made you decide to start a, a charter school because there are already a few here before you came. Yes. Um, well, thanks again for having me here. Uh, glad to be back. Um, ACES Technical Charter School is a school as a STEM focus. Okay. Uh, my background is in engineering and uh, I actually worked in the engineering field prior to coming into education. So I'm mm -hmm. a career changer. Um, and but you had a real life experience in engineering. Uh, exactly. So I worked at Ford Motor Company for about a decade uh, before coming into education. Um, I had started a program to help students prepare for the SAT, ACT. Uh, and so it really became passionate about education and uh, worked for about four different school districts uh, around the country in four different states before coming to New Mexico. Hmm. Um, but upon coming uh, to Albuquerque, I decided I wanted to start my own school. And so obviously having a technical background, I uh, thought it'd be good to start a STEM school, and obviously New Mexico has a lot of opportunity in technology and, sure. uh, and in STEM, so I think it kind of fits um, uh, what the students can prepare for as they get ready for the workforce. So I um, uh, decided to start the school from scratch, uh, decided to go with the state uh, as an authorizer for the charter, and went through that process, the application, and uh, getting community support and uh, different things like that, and we were able to get approved with a unanimous vote, uh, thankfully and uh, opened in the fall of 2020, right when COVID started. Right when everything got exciting yeah. again. Now, yeah. when you say STEM, a lot of people know what that means, but why don't you give us what, what STEM stands for? Sure, um, it is an acronym, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Okay. Uh, so it really is focused on 
helping students prepare for technical type of careers. When you looked at Albuquerque, when you looked at New Mexico, and you, said, you mentioned, hey, there's a lot of opportunity in the area of science and technology and so forth, did you see a void? Did you see that there wasn't enough educational emphasis there? Absolutely. Uh, often when you talk to folks from the labs, like Sandia Lab, other technical companies here in town, they often say that they have to recruit out of state. Hmm. Um, and even when you meet people who work at Sandia, oftentimes they come from other places and things like that. So sure. um, a lot of that is because there are, they don't feel that there is enough emphasis in the education realm on technology fields. So um, there are a couple of schools that are STEM focused here in the area. Uh, and I know New Mexico State, for instance, has a great engineering program. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, need, there still is a need for more. Okay. so. Find the void and fill the void, and that, that makes perfect sense. As uh, you got started, did you start as a K through 12? Did you start in a specific area of grades? What, how, how did you decide to launch your school? Sure. A lot of my experience, remember, it was ACT and SAT, so it's been secondary. Okay. And so when the school started, I did apply to be a 6 through 12 school. I didn't want to start just with high school because I knew that the middle school experience was really important to prepare the students for the high school. But what we found was that even our sixth graders who came in were quite a bit behind uh, in their mm -hmm. studies. And therefore, we spent a lot of time really teaching them elementary level material um, just to get them caught up. And so uh, this last year, I decided to go back to the Public Education Commission and request to have my grades ex expanded to K to five, and that was approved. Uh, so now we're a full K to 12 uh, approved school. Uh, of course, we're still small. We're growing and adding grades each year. But um, next year, we'll have six, seven, eight, and we're also looking to start K through three. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you that. So is that what, what, you know, what's next step for, mm -hmm. for ACES? Where, where are they going to be going as you look to the fall of uh, 2022, 2023? Doesn't it sound like we're you know, living in the space <laughs> ages, but it's not true. But I mean, when you look at the next school year and then mm -hmm. beyond, what are some of the thoughts? Sure. Uh, obviously, we want to continue to grow uh, here in Albuquerque. Um, and adding the elementary grades is going to give us the opportunity to do that, but also, again, to really control more of what the students are learning and making sure they're staying on track at those younger ages. So we're pretty excited um, to start that. Uh, it's a big endeavor for us, <laughs> for sure. Um, but, uh, but I think it's important to make sure that they're prepared for a rigorous program going forward. Well, you mentioned briefly that the COVID pandemic came right as you were preparing yeah. to open your school up for the first time. Mm -hmm. How did that shape, you know, the first year and a half of your experience? It was really, uh, I mean, I would say it was tough. I mean, it really was tough on everybody. I imagine. Um, but to open a school not knowing uh, whether you're going to be online or in person uh, was pretty stressful. So I basically tried to prepare as much as I could for both, uh, either scenario. Um, so we, uh, being a STEM school, we are tech heavy. And so I made sure that we had enough laptops for every student. Uh, of course, all the teachers at new laptops, but I also took it a step further where I, I Googled how to set up a YouTube studio, right? And so I found out the different equipment you need. And so I made sure the teachers in each of their classrooms had the tripod, the camera, and things Smart. like that. Uh, and so when we started uh, full-time um, online, uh, it was a pretty smooth transition. Uh, we actually did a summer program for two weeks prior to kind of give us a little experience as well. Uh, and that really helped to get some of the bugs out uh, of the system. And so by the time school started, we never missed one day of school, uh, even though the pandemic had started. Now, of course, at this juncture in the pandemic, you have regular classes? Yes. Okay, so yes. That, those things kind of are in the past. So at least you have the experience there if, if we ever are forced back into some Correct. sort of remote learning situation. You know, you did mention that there are other STEM uh, emphasis schools. So what makes ACES unique? I, I'm sure that there's something that makes you different than everybody else. What are those things? Well, I would say um, a lot of my own experience. I mean, coming as a true engineer, right? I mean, I, I, not okay. only do I have a couple of engineering degrees, but I worked in the field for over a decade. Um, and so I kind of bring a perspective in terms of what it takes to prepare. Um, doing the volunteer work of preparing kids for college for all those years also mm -hmm. gave me a really good idea of what it really means to have a strong college application and backing that down to elementary and middle and how you need to really prepare for that strong uh, uh, high school program that, that makes you competitive. And so those are some of the personal experiences I brought, um, I think. Um, in terms of best practices, when I worked in uh, Michigan, Virginia, Connecticut, and New Jersey, I picked up best practices from other school districts to see what they were doing that I thought was strong versus uh, not. And um, so a couple of things would be 
One is I believe that we don't do enough tutoring within the school day. Uh, okay. A lot of times it's either after school, Saturdays, things like that. And a lot of students either can't come or don't come, right? Right. And so I literally built a block of time in the middle of the school day where students are able to get support um, that they need to, uh, to imp increase their grades. Um, and so that has worked out, I think, quite well uh, for us. You have a captive audience, and it gives the students a chance to get the support uh, they need. Um, the emphasis on programming and robotics are also, is also there. So I've been purchasing quite a bit, again, of technology. And so I'm familiar with uh, things like VEX, BotBall, and competitions like that, um, and also coding. Uh, so we have every student in sixth grade, for instance, is mandatory that they learn Python uh, as a computer language. So, um, so some of those technical things that maybe uh, other educators aren't familiar with or as comfortable with, um, I definitely make sure that we infuse those things right into our regular everyday. Do you find that parents are, that they understand the need for having a strong STEM uh, education for their kids? Or is it something that, you know, maybe they haven't, they haven't grasped onto and you have to educate them as well, bringing them into the system and saying, hey, this is going to be important in the future. Well, I think it's interesting. They understand the future part of it. They say, well, yeah, I know there are good jobs out there, right, for people okay. with STEM degrees, but when it comes to what it takes to get there and the rigor, you know, in that program, right. a lot of parents maybe aren't as comfortable. Why are you giving my kid all this homework? Or this seems really strong. It's really tough for my kid. Why is it so hard? Uh, well, we're just trying to make sure they get the foundation they need. Uh, so when they get to the really tough classes later, they're prepared for them. As you're implementing things and you're growing and going into some of the, uh, you know, moving out of middle school now toward, toward high school and future mm -hmm. days, what kind of components, activities are you hoping that the kids will be able to participate in? Well, definitely competitions. Um, I'm really a strong proponent of uh, robotics competitions, even things like the spelling bee. I mean, things like that, I think, really motivate students to want to strive and be successful. Uh, and they like the reward that comes from winning with that. Uh, another component I want to make sure is that we're well-rounded. So I would like to have things like a jazz band uh, mm. and also some sports teams uh, to make sure that we're not just tech, right? I mean, engineers sure. can still be good at other things. And so, um, so we want to make sure we have a nice, well-rounded program. Yeah, is it too early to be thinking about the 2022-2023 school year, or is, is enrollment beginning to happen for that? Well, just now I'm putting together our marketing materials, and those will be going out very soon. Okay. And our application will be available online on our website as well. All right, and the website has been on the screen, and you can definitely uh, go there and find out different information yes. about applying and the different deadlines that are coming. Uh, give us uh, just any last thought, and uh, we sure appreciate you being with us today. Well, just uh, thankful for being here, um, and we're really looking to provide a very high-quality program for parents, so if they're interested, please let us know. Dr. Jerron Campbell with ACES Technical Charter School. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Let's go to the book of Judges, third chapter. Ruth, we start going through Judges and some of the uh, people who God uses, there's, there's large sections written about them, chapters, especially think of somebody like Samson. Mm -hmm. But others, there's not as much known or not as much written. And around the middle of this chapter, you hear about a man by the name of Ehud, mm -hmm. who was uh, a judge over Israel. Let's pick up reading about him in verse number 12 of Judges 3. Okay. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies, and then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. You know, and, and we know next it says that his name is, is Ehud, mm -hmm. the son of Gera. As you begin to look at that, there's some interesting things. First mm -hmm. of all, it starts off by saying, once again, the Israelites did evil. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a propensity in every generation to think that there's going to be exempted from the consequences of sin, but sin always brings death. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. You know, in our world today, we see sin, and when you see sin, you see heartbreak and sorrow and regret. And it, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's tragic that humanity has to learn the hard way, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm 
-hmm. And that's what happens in Israel's life. They begin to sin. The first time they got involved with sin, under Othniel, it says that they, they suffered under that persecution or that, that yeah. pain for eight years. This time, it was 18 years, and then at, they began to call out to the Lord. And it, and it says that, and the, the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer. Now, I think it's interesting that sometimes we think that things won't change. Mm. Uh, well, we'll just work our way out of it. We'll figure it out. I've heard people say, you know, God gave me a brain. I, he expects me to figure it out. <laughs> you know, oftentimes God is waiting for you to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Ask for wisdom. Yeah. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open unto you. Yep. That's right. And, and we see that, that God does a work. Now, this should be a great encouragement to us because it does point to this truth. God is a God of second chances. He did not give up on Israel just because this was the second time they'd blown it under mm -hmm. the judges and he was tired of it. He gives them a second chance. We're going to see that if you, if you read through judges, it, it's a recurring theme of their sin and God's mercy and grace. So I think that's something that should bless each of us is that God does help us, gives us a second chance. Have a blessed day today. Until next time.